Welcome back to the Calgary Guide video series. Today we're going to be talking about stroke and its pathogenesis. Note that there are four main types of stroke and that I will also be presenting a slide on the pathogenesis of acute ischemic stroke later on in this video. So stay tuned for that. But first, please consider supporting us in this nonprofit work to improve medical education by liking this video just as it's starting out and by subscribing to my channel. Thanks. And with that, let's get started. As I said already, there are four main types of stroke. There's acute ischemic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and venous sinus thrombosis. Each of these different types of stroke have their own different pathogenesis. For acute ischemia, this type of stroke has two main pathophysiological causes. First, ischemic stroke can arise from a blood clot commonly formed in the left side of the heart traveling to the brain. The other cause is the dislodgement of an atherosclerotic plaque formed in the internal carotid arteries traveling to the brain. Of course, atherosclerosis can also happen in the brain, leading to blood clot formation within the blood vessels of the brain. The occlusion of cerebral blood vessels is what causes acute ischemic stroke. Again, stay tuned for the latter half of this video, where I'll be talking about the pathogenesis of acute ischemic stroke in more detail. In terms of the two different types of intracranial hemorrhages, intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage, they share a common group of various causes. First, chronic hypertension can cause microaneurysms to form in the small arteries of the brain, and hypertensive hemorrhage in this manner often leads to bleeding within the brain parenchyma leading to intracerebral hemorrhage. Amyloid deposits causing vascular fragility can also cause the rupture of the blood vessels within the brain, resulting in bleeding within the brain parenchyma. There can also be tumors in the brain that hemorrhage, leading to intracerebral hemorrhage. Traumatic head injuries can cause coup or contra coup forces that damage blood vessels within white matter, leading to bleeding within the brain parenchyma. Arterial venous malformations can spontaneously bleed within the brain parenchyma. In addition, issues outside the brain, such as inherited and acquired coagulopathies, can cause bleeding anywhere within the body, and if it occurs within the brain parenchyma, that will also lead to an intracerebral hemorrhage. In terms of the causes of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is the rupture of an artery in the subarachnoid space, three common causes of that include an arterial venous malformation, traumatic head injury leading to a cerebral contusion that damages blood vessels in the subarachnoid space, as well as a ruptured arterial aneurysm, usually in the anterior circulation of the brain. Finally, the fourth type of stroke, venous sinus thrombosis, is usually caused by a hypercoagulable state, either due to hereditary or familial causes, exogenous estrogen, such as birth control pills, pregnancy, and postpartum situations. These situations result in a hypercoagulable state, one of the three prongs of Virchow's triad, which leads to thrombosis occurring in the large venous sinuses of the brain, which then go on to obstruct venous drainage and cause the signs and symptoms that they do. All four of these types of stroke impair blood supply to the affected area of the brain, resulting in the loss of function and associated symptoms that are characteristic of each type of stroke. And that's it for the pathogenesis of stroke as a general topic. Next, we move on to discussing the pathogenesis of acute ischemic stroke in more detail. This is the Calgary Guide slide on the pathogenesis of ischemic stroke, one of the four main causes of stroke. Ischemic stroke can be caused by a variety of issues. First, small artery occlusion, which is defined as acute infarction of basal or brainstem penetrating arteries that are less than 20 millimeters in diameter. Second cause of ischemic stroke is large artery atherosclerosis, which is defined as an atherosclerotic plaque reducing the diameter of intra- or extracranial blood vessels by over 50%. The third cause of ischemic stroke is cardioaortic embolism, which is defined as a blood clot that first forms in the heart, for example because of atrial fibrillation, then traveling to the brain via the vasculature. There are also other and unknown causes of ischemic stroke. Note that the pathogenesis of ischemic stroke is not exact and not very well known. However, we do know that each one of these causes will lead to the reduction of cerebral blood flow, or CBF. Reduced cerebral blood flow will reduce oxygen and glucose provided to the tissue of the brain in the location of the infarct, 
That results in an increased amount of anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic metabolism is an inefficient process which reduces the amount of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, available to the neurons. ATP is responsible for the function of sodium potassium pumps on the surface of neurons, so less ATP will reduce their function. Reduced function of sodium potassium pumps will result in sodium accumulating in the interstitial tissues of the brain outside neurons, and as a result, water will move to the interstitial regions of the brain outside neurons by osmosis. The increased presence of water in the interstitial tissues of the brain will cause brain edema, which will compress the blood vessels in the brain as well as brain tissue itself. Increased brain interstitial edema will also lead to the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, all of which combine to cause inflammation in the brain. Note that this is a type of inflammation known as secondary inflammation. We'll talk about primary inflammation in just a bit. Dysfunction of sodium potassium pumps on neurons can also result in increased sodium and calcium influx into the neuron as well as potassium outflux. That will result in depolarization of the neuron and the neurons releasing glutamate, a neurotransmitter. Reduced ATP can also directly cause astrocytes in the brain to release glutamate, a neurotransmitter. And so the increased amount of glutamate in the brain contributes to an overall level of excitotoxicity for the brain. This results in increased calcium influx into neurons which activates catabolic proteases, lipases, and nucleases, as well as contributes to oxidative and nitrosative injury, leading to necrosis of brain tissue. Increased anaerobic metabolism also leads to the increased production of lactate as a byproduct. The accumulation of lactate is dangerous to brain tissue, leading to astrocyte death, releasing cytokines like TNF-alpha into the cerebral fluid, contributing to inflammation of the brain in that area. The clearance of debris by microglia will also release cytokines into that area of the brain, contributing to inflammation. Reduced cerebral blood flow will also increase glucose metabolism in the penumbra, which is the section of the brain that's surrounding the acute infarct. That will lead to peri-infarct depression-like depolarizations, which activates biochemical pathways that increase the volume of the infarct. In other words, increasing the amount of brain tissue that continues to die from the stroke. And so this combination of necrosis, inflammation, and the negative spiral that contributes to increasing the volume of the infarct all add up to cause the weakness, slurred speech, visual field losses, and autonomic dysfunction that are characteristic of ischemic stroke. And there you have it, two slides that summarize the pathogenesis of stroke, both stroke in general and ischemic stroke. If you found these two series of Calgary Guide slides useful, please like this video and subscribe to our channel for more concise summaries about disease pathophysiology. Thank you for your support and see you in the next video.